How we doing? Glad to be here today, anybody? Come on. This week I had the opportunity, I was with uh, someone who was, had gone down to our Elevate City campus to help launch down there, and they said, how's it going in Milton? As if the place would fall apart without them. But anyway, uh, <laughs> I said, it's going great. And they said, well, what's great? And I don't know if they were testing me or not, but I let them have it. Because here's what I told them, right? Man, we saw 15 kids get baptized a few weeks ago. We got more people volunteering now than we've ever had. We're launching more groups than we've ever launched. We're seeing marriages restored. We had opportunity this week in the midst of the Afghanistan debacle. We have a partner who already has medium and shortwave radio broadcasts over the whole country that we were able to give some emergency funding to to see the gospel go forward in maybe one of the worst situations we've ever seen. So things are great. (laughs) Things are great. And God is doing a great work in the life of our church right now. And it's so fun to be a part of it. You know, we're in this series called Bricklayers. Let me hear you say Bricklayers. Bricklayers, yeah. And just this idea, um, man, that that we're always building, that we're always rebuilding. And we're looking at this, uh, this idea that in our own personal lives that we're building or rebuilding. But in our church, as we've come out of COVID and a lot of things are getting back to different uh, (laughs) that you know God's doing a lot of rebuilding in our church and he's doing it how brick by brick one person at a time one prayer at a time one dollar at a time one conversation at a time one relationship at a time one healed broken heart at a time one repaired marriage at a time one brick at a time and so we've just been taking these bricks and we've written prayers on them we've been praying over them over the last few weeks you know when we're looking through the lens of a guy named Nehemiah now, Nehemiah in the Bible is one of the great leadership studies that we see. If, if Nehemiah were alive today, he'd be in Harvard Business Review. He'd be uh, on the speaking circuit. You would see him on, with a TED Talk. He would have more followers than Joe Rogan on his podcast. I mean, he would be the man. And what Nehemiah did was the wall in the city of Jerusalem had been broken down, had been torn down by enemies and just by um, decay over the years. And so that the people who lived in Jerusalem, in Nehemiah's city, the, his, his families, his religious heritage, they, they were in danger. And so Nehemiah actually has been in, the cap, in a different city because he served the king because he was in slavery. And so Nehemiah goes back to rebuild the wall. And we know that as Nehemiah is rebuilding the wall, one of the things that Nehemiah says is people are trying to distract him and take him off point. He says, I'm doing a great work and I can't come down. So we've been rallying around this question, what great work are you doing? Like, what great work are you doing? And as we think about the idea of a great work, a great work necessarily means that that it's bigger than we are, that's outside of us. There's something in all of us that wants to do something and be a part of something that's bigger than we are. Amen? It's why so many of you are so excited for college football. Because that's from sometimes where we feel like we're a part of something bigger. God, it says, has placed eternity in our hearts. That there's something in us that whispers, that almost haunts us, that calls to us. That you can be a part of something bigger than yourself. You can be part of a great work. And we all want to be a part of the great work. You see, God wants to do something in you that's bigger than you. Amen? God wants to do something in you that is bigger than you. God wants to do something in you that is bigger than you. If your great work is all about you, your kingdom, your bank account, your family, your job, your relationships, it's just gonna all fade and you'll never find the satisfaction that you're looking for. God wants to do a great work. Now, now as we look at Nehemiah today, we're gonna come across um, Nehemiah chapter three as we're just walking through this book. And this is one of those chapters, how many of you have ever read like more than three pages in the Bible? Raise your hand. Right, like a lot of people, not everybody, because a lot of people are new to this and we believe that God's word will change you. But there's sometimes when you're reading through a plan and you come to a section, you're like, this has no meaning, it's a bunch of names and you just kind of just kind of skip over it, right? That's that's allowed, by the way, in case you need a pastor to tell you that. You know, and sometimes you come to a passage like, oh, this really it doesn't look like it's gonna have much for me. And today is on the surface looks like that. Because we're gonna look at 10 gates today. And it's going to talk about how Nehemiah and his crew rebuilt the gates of the city. And what we're going to see is that these 10 gates actually 
communicate a message. I think we have an image of the 10 gates that they're going to be rebuilding um, around the city. You have, we're going to, and we're going to walk through every single one of these sheep, fish, old valley, dung, fountain, water, horse, east inspection. We're going to walk through all those gates. And here's why. You have 10 gates and in God and his wisdom, his creativity and his genius uses these 10 gates to point to one gospel. Amen. It's going to be, you're going to, your eyes are going to be open like, oh, wow, the Old Testament actually does matter. And here's another thing that's going to happen. There's a lot of names in here and there's a lot of names in Hebrew. And I'm going to read every one of them. I'm going to go through all of them. It will be awkward at times. And the reason why you'll find out at the end of the message, right? So all right, Nehemiah chapter three, let's go. And that's Nehemiah chapter three. I believe that God's just going to stir something in us. He's going to give us a vision for our families, for our neighborhoods, for our jobs. So in chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Then Eliashib, the high priest, rose up with his brothers, the priests, and they built the sheep gate. They consecrated it. They set its doors. They consecrated it as far as the Tower of the Hundred, as far as the Tower of Hananel. And next to him, the men of Jericho built. And next to them, Zachar, the son of Emery, built. So this very first gate that we see is the sheep gate. The sheep gate obviously is really important. Now, he, here's why it was called the sheep gate. Is this was the gate where shepherds brought their sheep into, this sheep into the city of Jerusalem to be offered as sacrifice. So this was the gate where all the traffic came through. And in that culture, there was a sacrifice for sin. They sacrificed animals. So this is why it's called the sheep gate. But, but we also know that Jesus came along. And, and taught us something about sheep and shepherds, didn't he? Jesus said this, he says, I'm the good shepherd. And the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. So what we see in this gate, what appears on the surface to be something that's just, uh, just kind of a chronicle of construction, actually we see God and his genius point to the shepherd that we all have. Right here, the gates, the great work of the gospel delivers a shepherd for our souls, is what this gate is telling us. And a shepherd is just somebody who gets your ear. It's just somebody that you listen to. It's somebody that you pay attention to. And we got a lot of shepherds that aren't really good for our soul. Amen. Man, we got lots of shepherds. Call it social media. Call it the news media. Call it politics. Call it some bad friends we got. And we got some bad shepherds. And in Jesus, what we have is a shepherd who will never let us down. A shepherd who is always there for us. A shepherd who will guide us. And we need some guidance now because it just got dark in here, doesn't it? Is that just me? No. All right, we'll get that fixed. Um, man, we need someone to, man, to guide us, to instruct us, to inform us. That's the kind of shepherd that we have. Listen, do you know this good shepherd? Do you know the good shepherd? This she good shepherd is so good, we got to get the word out. We got to get the word out. Watch what happens in, that next, in the next gate in verse 3. It says this. It says, the sons of Hassanah built a fish gate. They laid its beams, set its doors, its bolts, and its bars. And next to them, Merimoth, the son of Uriah, the son of Hakaz, repaired. And next to them, Meshulam, the son of Berechiah, the son of Meshezabel, repaired. And next to them, Zadok, the son of Baena, repaired. And next to them, the Tekoites repaired. But their nobles would not stoop to serve the Lord. So, so right here, what you have is you have, you have this fish gate. And I think, you know, what, that feels a little obvious, but... The fish gate is where fish would come into the city. And it was, this, it was this place that was down by the sea. It was down by where the fishermen would come up. They would bring their catch. They would sort it out. They would get rid of the bad fish, get the good, and then they would bring them into the city. Now, we know what Jesus said about fishermen, don't we? In Matthew chapter 4, Jesus finds Andrew and he finds Peter. And in Matthew chapter 4, Jesus says, hey, follow me, follow me, and I will make you what? Fishers of men. So we have a fish gate that points to this command by Jesus that we would be fishers of men. Now, Jesus said that to some fishermen in Matthew chapter 4. And so, so here's the great work of the gospel. The great work of the gospel chases you down. The great work of the gospel chases you down. Hey, have you ever noticed that fish don't jump in the boat? You have to catch them. You have to go after them. And the reality is, I believe this is one of the areas where American Christianity is real, their, their gate is tremendously broken. Because most Christians, based on a study by Barna, will go to their graves without ever sharing their faith. And I just wonder how that goes when we stand before the Lord and he's like, hey, remember that fish, that fish thing I taught you about? That great commission I taught you about? Like, how'd you do with that? 
And it says that the nobles wouldn't even bend down to help them, wouldn't even stoop, wouldn't even put the work on their neck, it says. And so many times what can happen is we get so distracted with doing other things, we forget that we need to be fishers of men, that we need to be the people who are going after other people. Now, I want you to just let this settle in for just a second. Without you, someone could live without God. Think about this for a minute. Without you, someone could live without God. Now, now on the surface, you may say, ah, you know, there's God's sovereignty. There's all those things that go in there. I don't know about that. But what, what if, rather than just coming up with some theological arguments, we took that seriously? Like, who told you? Man, was it your mom or your dad or your neighbor? Maybe it was at Young Life or at a church camp or at some other type of event or some friend in high school. Like, who told you? And we can't let the gospel stop right there. Let me ask you, who's God putting on your heart? Maybe even right now. Text them. Go ahead. I won't care. I can't see you. It got dark. <laughs> like, like who's God put, who does God want you to invite? And who, God, who does God want you to step into their life a little bit to be a fisher of, man, the great work of the gospel is that God chases you down. And then we, and then we continue to go on in verse, uh, we're going to start in verse, pick up in verse six. It says, Joida, the son of Pasea, and Meshulam, the son of Bes- Besodea, repaired the gate of Yeshana. They laid its beams, they set its doors, its bolts, and its bars. And next to them repaired Melatiah the Gibeonite, and Jadon the Moranathite, the men of Gibeon and of Mizpah, the seat of the governor of the province beyond the river. Next to them, Uziel, the son of Harhiah, goldsmiths repaired. So you got goldsmiths who are doing brickwork. Then it goes on to say that next to him, Hananiah, one of the perfumers repaired, and they restored Jerusalem as far as the broad wall. Next to them, Rephiah, the son of Hur, ruler of the half district of Jerusalem, repaired. And next to them, Jediah, the son of Harumaf, repaired opposite his house. And next to him, Hattush, the son of Hashabaniah, repaired. Malchijah, the son of Hauram, and Hashab, the son of Pehath Moab, repaired another section and the tower of the ovens. Next to him, Shalom, the son of Halahash, ruler of the half district of Jerusalem, repaired. He and his daughters repaired. So they come and they work on this gate. It's called Yeshana, but this gate also is called the Old Gate because this, is the, this was the gate where the elders of the city would come and they would be right in front of this gate and it's where decisions were made. It was like the town square. It was where they mediated disputes and made decisions that were for the good of the community and it's where the, the elders gathered. And this gate represents the ancient paths that we follow in. The people who've come before us, the teachings and the truth that have come before us, it means it represents the ancient past. In the book of Jeremiah, chapter 6, Jeremiah's writing, he says, hey, stand, stand by the roads and look for the ancient past. Look for the good way, walk in them, and then you'll find what? Rest for your souls. Like we're never going to outgrow the gospel, right? It's never going to get old. It's never going to get worn out. It's never going to stop working. We're never going to need something new. This is the gospel. Listen, the great work of the gospel is that you have an ancient path to a new life. The great work of the gospel is that you have an ancient path to a new life. A beautiful thing about this gate as well is it leads into actually what was called the new quarter in Jerusalem. So you literally took the old gate, the ancient path to a new life. So many times we're looking for new teaching, we're looking for something fresh, we're looking for something new when it's found in Jesus. The gospel never changes. (laughs) Jesus died for our sins, rose from the grave, and lives to make intercession for us. Jesus said this, I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. He who was, he who is, and who is to come. Everything is wrapped up in him. It's all that we have. It's more than we need. We have the gospel. Listen, this is the great work of the gospel. As a church, our methods can change. You know, things will change at times. Maybe it's music or maybe it's how we do group life or maybe it's how we do volunteers or maybe, you know, how, how we, what areas of ministry we focus on. You know what will never change? The message, the ancient paths. Some, some things never will run dry. The ancient paths, that's the old city gate. Then we go on to the, uh, verse 13, the next gate. It says this, Hanun, the inhabitants of Zenoa, repaired the valley gate. They rebuilt it, they set its doors, its bolts, and its bars. And they repaired a thousand cubits of wall as far as the dung gate. And we'll get to the dung gate in a minute because it's exactly what you think. (laughs) So the valley gate. 
So in Jerusalem, there's three valleys around, and they all terminate right here in front of this gate. Hence the valley gate. And we all know what a valley is. It's a place that's low. It's representative of sorrow and sadness and tragedy. Like we may not have a lot in common. One thing that all of us in this room have in common is we're going to have tough times. We're going to have some difficulty. Some of you are going through it right now. It's hard to even sit in here without tears welling up in your eyes, wondering what's going to happen when you get out, wondering what's next. We all go through these times of sorrow. And we know that God's offered to be with us in the valley. God does, he does some of his greatest work in the valley. And God does his greatest work at growing us, changing us, making us more like him, showing himself to be full of goodness and power in the valley. Psalms chapter 23 says, Even if I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And we go through so many different kinds of valleys in our life. And we'll go through valleys of discouragement. We don't know where to turn. We go through valleys of confusion, maybe even over our fates. We go through valleys of despair. We go through valleys that want to take us down. But listen, God does his greatest work. I wrote this phrase about this. It says, God's great joy is lifting you out of the deepest valley. God's great joy is to lift you up out of the deepest valley. The great work of the gospel grows good from bad. The great promise that Jesus gives us is that what Satan intends for evil, God's gonna use for good. That no matter what happens to us, God is so big and so good and so large and in charge that he's gonna work it for his glory and for our good, even when we can't see it. Man, this is the valley gate. Every one of these gates connects directly to the person of Jesus, the great work of the gospel. Now we go on to the, the dung gate, the fun one. It says in verse 14, Malchijah, the son of Rechab, ruler of the district of Beth Hakram, repaired the dung gate. He rebuilt it and set its doors, its bolts, and its bars. I find it interesting that every other gate has a lot of people working on it, but this one only has one. What's going on with that? <laughs> Right, you have, you have the dung gate. And what we know about this is there's some things in all of our life that need to be taken out. This literally was the gate where they took the trash. It's where all the refuse of the city was taken out and it was burned and it burned in this place kind of down called Gehenna. And Jesus would often refer to this place when speaking about hell. And so he, he, all the trash comes out, all of the junk comes out, everything that needs to go. Anything in your life maybe need to go? need to be eliminated, thrown on the trash heap, right? This is the beauty of the gospel. That's what we call repentance, changing our mind, going a different direction. Jesus said in Mark chapter one, verse 15, he said, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom is at hand, repent and believe the gospel. Turn from your ways. You know, and sometimes what can happen is there's stuff, junk, trash, garbage that creeps into our life and we just don't even know it. We just get so used to being around it, we forget about it. A couple of years ago, or last year when we uh, moved to a different house, and so one of, the, one of the requirements is we had to get our septic tank pumped. Anybody got a septic tank in here? Some of y'all do. Some of you are missing out on life. <laughs> so, so one of the things about a septic tank, obviously, is uh, I mean, when you get it pumped out, it's, it's an interesting process. And we'd been in that house for 17 years and never had it pumped out. 17, what? You think I got a lot of, what do you mean? <laughs> like, why would you do that if you don't have to is all I'm saying. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. No, nah, so we get it pumped, right? And um, so I'm, I'm curious. I'm going to see how this thing works. So I go outside and, you know, they find it and they open it and they start pumping it out. I'm like, oh, okay. So I go back inside. My wife is losing her mind. She's tightening all the windows. She's closing the blinds, you know, being sure the door. I'm like, what is wrong? She says, it smells so bad. I'm like, I, I can't even smell it. Then I walk back outside, and guess what? I could smell it then. And this is what sin does in our life sometimes. It starts out small, it creeps in, we don't notice it until it's just so bad and so destructive that we have this massive blind spot. All right, what trash needs to come out of your life today? Man, is it gossip? Is it the way you use your words? Maybe discouragement? Maybe it's anger and frustration? Maybe it's cynicism? You know, maybe it's some appetites that just gotten out of control, whether it's alcohol or food or sex or some drugs that you've kind of slipped into. It's no big deal. 
and it's going to destroy your life. Now, the beauty, the beauty, beauty of this one is that man, out it goes. There's a place that takes all of our trash. The great work of the gospel is that God takes out your trash. That God takes out your trash. Then we go on to the next one. We're going to go on to the, the fountain gate. Now, this has the most names, and I'm going to read them all. Again, there's going to be a point in just a minute. I'm going to attempt to read them all. Uh, and so follow along and sympathize with me. And Shalom, the son of Kol Hosea, ruler of the district of Mizpah, repaired the fountain gate. He rebuilt it, he covered it and set its doors, its bolts and its bars. And he built a wall of the pool of Shelah, of the king's garden, as far as the stairs that go down into the city of David. After him, Nehemiah, the son of Azbuk, ruler of the half district of Beth Zul, repaired to a point opposite the tombs of David, as far as the artificial pool and as far as the house of the mighty men. After him, the Levites repaired. Rehum, the son of Bani, next to him, Hashabiah, ruler of the district of Keilah, repaired for his district. After him, their brothers repaired. Baviah, the son of Henadad, ruler of the half district of Keilah. Next to him, Ezer, the son of Jeshua, ruler of Mizpah, repaired another section opposite the ascent to the armory at the buttress. After him, Baruch, the son of Zabai, repaired another section from a buttress to the door of the house of Eliashib, the high priest. After him, Merimoth, the son of Uriah, the son of Hakaz, repaired another section from the door of the house of Eliashib to the end of the house of Eliashib. After him, the priests, the men of the surrounding area repaired. And after them, Benjamin and Hashab repaired opposite their house. After them, Azariah, the son of Masiah, the son of Ananiah, repaired beside his own house. After him, Benuai, the son of Henadad, repaired another section from the house of Azariah to the buttress and to the corner. Palal, the son of Uzai, repaired opposite the buttress and the tower projecting from the upper house of the king at the court of the guard. Come on. Now, now this is called, obviously, this is about the fountain gate. You may have lost that in all the names. But this is the fountain gate. Now, the fountain gate actually was the one that had taken on the most damage. When Nehemiah was surveying the gates, he couldn't even get past this one. This is how important it was. And the fountain gate was where people would go in as they're going into the city of Jerusalem. And there was a pool there, the pool of Siloa. And in that pool, they would have a ritual washing. They would wash themselves before they went into worship. This was one of the ways that God always highlighted being, being clean before him. You would wash your physical body only as a symbol of washing your heart, your motives being pure and being completely dedicated to God. So this was the fountain gate. And, and the fountain gate is where everybody was made clean. Now, Jesus said this when it came to fountain. He talked about living water. He said, whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of him will flow living water. So at the fountain gate, we have this idea of being made clean before God. And that God knows through our sin, we are dirty, we are set apart, and we are separate from him. But, but the great work of the gospel makes you clean. You know, there's sometimes that there's nothing like a good bath, a good hot shower, Right? Sometimes if you've been out working or out doing something outside, maybe you've been at the gym and just to be able to get in the shower and to just clean off. And this is what happens. So your shame that, that follows you around, that thing you remember that you did, that sexual promiscuity, that, that financial uh, impropriety, that relational destruction, and the shame and the guilt that you feel from that, gone. Like, like you're clean. Satan can't hold that over your head anymore. That thing that you think everybody in the room knows, but they really don't, but Satan tells you they do. If Satan uses to beat you down and hold you back, it's gone. Man, you're clean because of why the great work of the gospel makes you clean. Then we continue in verse 29. Uh, 26, yeah. 
25. All right. <laughs> Half of 25. After him, Padaiah, the son of Parosh, and the temple servants living on Ophel repaired to a point opposite the water gate on the east and the projecting tower. After him, the Tekoites repaired another section opposite the great projecting tower as far as the wall of Ophel. So in here, you see this idea of the water gate, right? You have the, we have this idea of the water gate. Now, now in the Bible, the scripture refers to itself as water that can wash you and cleanse you. So the water gate in this scenario is actually God's word. This is the power of God's word, the work of God's word. Jesus even said this. It says this about Jesus. It says the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us and we beheld his glory as the only son of the father full of grace and truth. Like this is the word, the written word actually points us to the living word, Jesus. Right, everything that we read in the Bible, and even as I'm pointing out today, and if you didn't believe me before today, certainly after I've gone through 10 gates and 100 people, like you, you have to believe that God uses these things to point to Jesus. Like this is the great work that God's written word actually points to the living word. It points to Jesus. Listen, the great work of the gospel transforms your life through God's words. It's a little like this. What we like to say around here is like when you open your Bible, God opens his mouth. Like God wants to speak to you. He wants to change you. And a lot of times it, it feels like a colander. You're just pouring your life through that colander and God's word serves to sift out the bad things and to keep in the good things and to teach you and to train you and guide you. That's why we're so passionate about reading the Bible. It's not so that we would read it, but so that we would absorb it and it would transform our lives and change us. This is the function of the great work of the gospel at the water gate. Then we, as we continue on, it says in verse 28, it says, Above the horse gate, the priests repaired, each one opposite his own house. And after them, Zadok, the son of Imer, repaired opposite his own house. So we have this gate that's called the horse gate. And, and the horse gate was used in, 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 that, in that culture. Horses were not used for transportation. Uh, they were not nice logos for cities back in the day. You got that? Make that connection. You used donkeys and camels for transportation. Horses were used to march into battle. And so the horses, the stables were kept, kept next to the king's palace so that whenever war orders came or they knew they were attacked, they would have easy access to get to the horses and they could ride them into battle. And so this is what this image is for us at the horse gate. It's this image of battle. It says in Revelation, it says, I saw heaven open up. And behold, a white horse, the one sitting on it, faithful and true, meaning Jesus. In righteousness, he judges and makes war. Like there's places in the Bible, it says the Lord is a warrior, the Lord is his name. And so, you know, we can't be blind to the real battle that's happening. You see, the great work of the gospel prepares you for the real battle. Man, this week as I'm watching the news, like many of you, just struck by the horrific scenes that come out of Afghanistan. And as I watch people scrambling for the airport and trying to climbing over people, and as I watch parents handing their babies to American soldiers, I couldn't help but be reminded of the great battle that's happening. The great battle that's happening behind the scenes, the warfare between Satan and God, between good and evil, and all that's going on, and that we find ourselves caught in this same type battle. And we have to be prepared for battle. And what's the battle for? It's for people's souls. Like your great battle is not with your spouse. They are not the great enemy. Your great battle is not your children or your neighbor. And the great battle is against Satan. And the great work of the gospel will prepare you for the real battle. The first thing, the first thing it does, it helps us to see the real battle, that we're reminded of the real battle, that it's not some hocus pocus out there in the middle of anywhere, like that it's real and active, that Satan is prowling around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he can devour. And you know some people that have been devoured, don't you? And some of you feel like you've been devoured, but we have the great work of the gospel that prepares us for the real battle. As we keep on in verse 29, it says, After him, Shemaiah, the son of Shechaniah, the keeper of the east gate, repaired, after him, Hananiah, the son of Shelemiah, and Hanun, the sixth son of Zalaph, repaired another section. After him, Meshulam, the son of Berechiah, repaired opposite his chamber. So right here, we see this, this east gate. We see the east gate. 
Now, the east gate is the one that's prophesied where Jesus is coming back into the city of Jerusalem. Like, this, this, this is a big deal, right? Jesus is coming back into the city of Jerusalem from the east gate. And what this does in our life, when we remember that Jesus is coming back, it tethers our life to a real hope, to our true hope, is what the great work of the gospel does. You know, one of the things that we need to remember is that when that Jesus is coming back and there's some promises that we get that I love, he's going to wipe away every tear. There'll be a time when there's no more tears, no more suffering, no more confusion, that we'll see him as he is. There'll be no more ambulances. There'll be no more bad news stories. There'll be no more morgues. There'll be no more hospitals. There'll be no more cancer wards. There'll be no more NICU and PICU and all the things that are so devastating to us. It's going away. And we need that anchor today. Amen? Like we need to remember where our hope is. Listen, if you're here today and you don't have that hope, oh, you need, you need to know the great work of the gospel. But you're going to have to wait because i got another gate to go through. <laughs> the gospel tethers our life to our true hope. And then we have the last gate. It says in, in verse 31, he starts, it says, After him, Malchijah, one of the goldsmiths, repaired as far as the house of the temple servants and of the merchants opposite the muster gate or inspection gate, is what that means, to the upper chamber of the corner. And between the upper chamber of the corner and the sheep gate, the goldsmiths and the merchants repaired. So now you have, now you have the inspection gate, that there comes this point where, where our lives are inspected. This is where soldiers would gather and the king would come and inspect the troops right in front of this gate. And King David was the very first one to ever do that. And so what we see is that our lives are going to be inspected. Like we're going to be judged. Our, our works are going to be weighed out. Now, if we follow Jesus, that's, we, will, we'll, we still will enjoy eternity with him, but there's still going to be a question about what we did this, with this one and only life that we have and how we operated and how we leveraged everything we had for then. Because that's the call that God has on us. For people who are without Jesus, they're going to be inspected and they're going to be judged. And their judgment's obviously going to be more severe. They're going to spend eternity separated from God because that's what it means. That's what the judgment will be for them. And the way that we'll be judged, the great work of the gospel, like will measure your life by what matters to God, not to you. Like... The things that we'll be judged for are based on what matters to God, not based on what matters to me, unless what matters to me is what matters to God. And so with that in mind, we should leverage everything. We should store up treasure in heaven. We should leverage our time by building into people and breathing life into them, the life of the gospel. Man, we should leverage our resources by being generous to store up treasure in heaven as Jesus teaches us, because where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. Like this is the great work of the gospel in our lives that we will be, we'll have this inspection at the end of time. What do you think matters to God? Like, what do you think matters to God? Man, based on his word and based on everything I know, I can tell you a little bit. Man, I tell you what, the poor matter to God. The marginalized matter to God. Man, the, the homeless matter to God. The fatherless matter to God. The abused matter to God. The marginalized matter to God. The left out matter to God. The left behind matter to God. And you matter to God. Everyone matters to God. God doesn't care about your house, your car. He doesn't care about your favorite sports team, obviously. He doesn't care about all the things that we spend a lot of time and money on. God cares about people. God cares about people. How are you leveraging your life for people? This is how, this is how you build a great life, not just a great work. Ten gates, ten gates around the city, ten gates that point us to the gospel, ten, ten gates, one gospel. It's a very simple gospel. Your great work is what this is. Now, what I love about this, and the reason I read all the names today or attempted to, to read all the names is because everybody played a part. Every single person. And I know that if I were building that wall and my name got in the Bible, I would want somebody to read it out loud one day. 
So it tells us that everybody, whether you are a goldsmith, a perfumer, a, a noble, or a leader, whoever you are, everybody played a part in rebuilding the wall. And you have a part to play. You have a part to play. This is not just, it's not just for fun. It's not just a social outlet. It is life-changing and transformational. And people's lives are at stake. And everything points to Jesus. Man, just a little story about me. At the, uh, when, I, when I turned, when I was in my mid-20s, my wife and I had gotten, ma- had gotten married. And so we had moved to a new community. And we were looking for just some social outlet. And so in that culture, we, went, we tried church. It's not necessarily what happens now, but in that culture that many years ago, we tried church. And so we began going to church and we just wanted to find a place we belonged, find someone that cared about us, actually expected us. And I'll never forget walking into this church and we walk in and we're clearly early because nobody else is there. You guys know if you're a guest, you're always earlier than the people who come regularly. You notice how that works? Not any of y'all, of course, but you know how it goes. And so we show up and there's some people over in the corner kind of talking and they look up and see us over by the door, clearly surprised that somebody new had showed up. And so we walk over and begin to talk to them and they kind of fumble around and tell us where we should go. And they tell us to go down the, ho- go down the hall and, and there's the third door on your left, kind of like you're at Home Depot, like aisle six for the electrical wire, you know. And so my wife and I, we walk down and we look in the room and nobody's in there. And so at this point, we're a little frustrated. We're intimidated. Man, we didn't know what we were doing, you know, exactly how the process worked. We didn't know if we were out of place, in place, if they wanted us to be there or not. So as we looked in the room and nobody was there, we just kept right on walking, went out the front door, got in our car and left. Now, can you imagine if if I would have just said, church isn't for me? Man, those people, they don't care about us. I don't even know if what they believe is right. Now, like, can you imagine if that would have happened? I can, pro- I can, with a fair amount of certainty, tell you I wouldn't have been married for over 30 years. I, with, a certain, with a fair amount of certainty, I could tell you I wouldn't have the four kids that I have and the grandchild that I have and the one on the way. I, I could for certainty tell you I wouldn't be here experiencing all that God's doing. But in God's grace... We went to another church that morning, and I'll never forget walking in. And my friend is Dennis Metter. And Dennis was right there to talk, and Dennis is kind of crazy. And so Dennis, we we hung out for a bit. He showed us around, gave us the the tour, engaged us after. We ended up becoming really good friends. And that church is where I gave my life to Christ. It's where my first child was born. It's where I was called to ministry, all because of Dennis Metter. And that's the part that you can play in somebody's life. It's that powerful when we all lock arms together for the great work of the gospel. Like in your chair, you've got a card to volunteer, to be a part of the dream, to help make, continue to make this place special. You know, we've had a call out for volunteers in our now gen ministries, and we've had those. But some of you guys are like, I don't know about that. But, but here's what we do need. Man, on Sunday morning, we need this place to be spectacular and making people feel like we're expecting them. Amen? Man, we want to be the friendliest church we can because we're going to be so transformational in people's lives. And you never know what one smile, one held door, man, one good morning could do to save someone's marriage, to save their purpose, to breathe life into them the same way Dennis Matter did for me. Like somebody in this church that's coming is the next Stephen Gibbs. And I think that's good. (laughs) Somebody's the next you. But without you, they're going to just make the circle, go back out in the parking lot and get in their car. So I would just love for you to take your car, take an opportunity to fill that out, an opportunity for you to be able to be a part of all that God is doing and just drop it in the boxes as you exit today. But some of you need to know the Good Shepherd the one who died for your sins, the one who can make you clean and transform your heart. Man, let me just tell you about the Jesus behind the gates. We were born 
and we sinned and we fell apart, fell away from God. But God is so good and so gracious. He's all, he offered us a way out. That in the midst of all our trash, all the things that need to be taken out, he offered to take it out for us. And by following Jesus, you get this new life. And you get to be made clean. You get to be transformed. You get not just a new body, but you get a new heart to center your motivations. It's so much better than I could even describe with words. But I think you already know that. Let's pray together. So just with our heads bowed and eyes closed in this moment, man, there's some people you just need to quit playing. You need to get off the bench. You need to quit just showing up because it feels like the good thing to do and it makes you feel better about yourself. Because if the work of your life is about you, it's going to never live up to what God has for you. So I'm just going to lead you into just a short prayer right now, just to make that step to follow Jesus today, to be a part of the great work of the gospel today. And so if that's you today and you need to take those steps, I'm just going to invite you to, to pray after me. Dear God, thank you for being good. I have sinned. Make me clean. I trust that Jesus died for me and I'm going to follow him in my whole life. And I'm going to believe that the, at the inspection, I'm going to be clean. You know, and the Bible says, and if you did that, if you did that, and you're a new person, God's taken you from old to new, darkness to light, death to life. And if that's you, I just want to help you mark that moment today. The, the greatest decision you will ever make is the decision to follow Jesus. So if that was you today, I'm just going to count to three and just ask you to slip your hand up in the air and just make eye contact with me. Just to mark the moment on the count of three. One, two, three. Praise the Lord. Amen. That's awesome. God, man, what great work are we doing? Man, how are you measuring the work of our lives today, God? Lord, just give us, I mean, just give us spiritual eyes to fight the right battles. Give us the right heartbeat. Help our hearts to beat for what your heart beats for. God, help us to never get tired of, of helping people just like me and just like hundreds of people in this room, God. It would always be that we give our lives for the good of others, to build them up and to breathe life into them through the great work of the gospel. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen.